Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's planet, I'm sorry, panel discussion. Planets in the next sentence. Panel discussion, lunar and planetary resources. Are asteroids, the moon, and Mars really a viable source of useful resources? Uh, my name is Bill Crossley. I am the J. William Urig and Anastasia Vornas head of the School of Aeronautics and Astronautics. And I, I'm pleased to help kick off today's event in the Purdue, got to get this right, Purdue Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series, which we obviously make it an acronym because that's what the engineers do, so PEDALS. So I know what PEDALS is, but I don't always remember what all the words are. <laughs> this series is sponsored by the College of Engineering in conjunction with all the schools, and today we get to host, as the School of Aeronautics and Astronautics, and we've got a visitor today, as the title of the panel indicates, somebody who's really directly aligned with space exploration. So to get things started, I have the honor to introduce our panel moderator, and he's going to subsequently introduce all the panelists, including our Purdue Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series visitor. And he's going to give you a little bit about how the panel's going to run today. So with that, let me introduce our moderator, Mr. Andrew Cox. Andrew is a PhD candidate here in aeronautics and astronautics. He's a NASA Space Technology Research Fellow, and in that position, he explores the motion of spacecraft affected both by low thrust propulsion forces and multiple gravity fields, right? So the multi-body problem. Following graduation, Andrew plans to continue working in the space sector, supporting spacecraft mission design. So with that, please welcome Mr. Andrew Cox. All right, thank you, Professor Crossley. So to get started, I'll introduce our panelists here. Our distinguished guest is Professor Daniel Shears. He visits us from the University of Colorado in Boulder. Uh, he's a distinguished professor, the A. Richard Seabass Endowed Chair there. Uh, joining us from Purdue, our remaining panelists, we have Professor Jay Maloche. He is also a distinguished professor in the Department of Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences and of the Physics and Astronomy here at Purdue. Uh, professor Antonio Bombet. It's the Edgar B. and Hedwig M. Olson Professor in Civil Engineering. And Professor Brioni Horgan is an Assistant Professor of Planetary Science in the Department of Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences. So as Professor Crossley mentioned, our topic today is the viability of gathering resources from places other than Earth. There's a lot of excitement about colonizing the moon. NASA's big goal right now is to get humans back to the moon and to establish a permanent presence there. Uh, but also, there's lots of excitement about going to Mars. We have multiple missions to asteroids. Um, and as we move out from the Earth, we're obviously, obviously going to need a lot of resources. Uh, so one of the, the obvious questions is, where are these resources going to come from? Are we going to launch them from Earth, which can be very expensive, or are we going to gather them in space? And if we're going to try and gather things from space, um, what kind of challenges are we going to have? What can we get? Um, so that's what we're going to talk about today. What kinds of resources uh, we can gather? And this is going to lead into Professor Shear's talk that's at 4.30, where he discusses more about asteroid missions. So this is 3.30, excuse me. It ends at 4.30. Um, so yeah, we'll jump right into it. The, we're going to start with outlining a couple big topics, really briefly, I think, because um, it's not the most interesting of the questions that we want to talk about is what are these resources? And then we'll talk about how are these resources potentially used in space or perhaps back on Earth? And then we'll, we'll jump into the, the more detailed and interesting topic is what, what kinds of challenges do we face both in gathering and using and, and what are the challenges in gathering these resources? We're gonna do a panel discussion here for about the first 30 minutes, and then we'll open it up to audience questions. So um, be thinking as we're, as we're talking of questions that you wanna ask these panelists as we go. All right, so to begin with, um, I'd like to get each of the panelists maybe to give just a couple sentences or a few minutes about, about your research and how it relates to space exploration and, and the resources that we can find there. So I think we'll just go down the line to start with Professor Shears. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Andrew. Um, so uh, my research area is largely focused on uh, understanding how we can send spacecraft to uh, explore small bodies in the solar system. By small bodies, I mean asteroids and comets and the like. And, and really, the, maybe the best way of thinking about them, and especially in terms of resources, are we're going to send, we're sending spacecraft out to explore 
these very primitive bodies in the solar system. These are bodies, uh, the materials that they're made of have not been substantially altered uh, since the formation of the solar system, or if they have, they haven't been nearly as processed as they are on the Earth. And, 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 and hence, uh, there, there might be some, uh, you know, definitely some valuable uh, uh, species, minerals, uh, iron cores, what have you, uh, that could be available for, you know, for utilization. Although my expertise is certainly not in the area of what these things are made out of. I think other, uh, other of our esteemed panel are much, much better uh, suited to, to talk about that. Um, I, I will say that probably the, the most valuable resource uh, uh, that exists in these primitive bodies may in fact be this common everyday water, uh, which actually has many, many uses in space uh, for propulsion and for human, uh, uh, you know, for, for humans to keep them alive and going and shielded from, from uh, radiation and all that. So I'll, I'll just cut off there and let you continue. Okay, my, my basic research is impacts, uh, which might not seem to have much to do with uh, resources, but I participated in 2005 in a deep impact mission where we ran a 300-kilogram uh, spacecraft into uh, Comet Temple 1 at 10 kilometers per second in order to find out what was inside, just like any child uh, figures out what's inside a strange object by smashing it. We did exactly that to Comet Temple 1 and uh, learned a bit, not as much as we had originally hoped, but we learned a bit about um, what was uh, inside the comet. Since then, I participated in the GRAIL mission with people here um, at the AAE department um, with uh, uh, Professor Howell and a number of uh, former PhD students. And uh, we uh, worked with the GRAIL mission to look for uh, empty lava tubes on the moon. And we found them. In fact, we found rather large empty lava tubes on the moon that we believe would be uh, a great resource for humans to live inside, to get shielded uh, from radiation, from meteorite impact, and so on. How that, that bears on resources, uh, I'm not sure directly. Um, there, there's been some language about uh, water condensed inside lava tubes, but we don't know that that um, is in fact the case. Maybe sulfur might be from the volcanic eruptions that made them. Um, I certainly agree that the major resource in the inner solar system is water. If we were in the outer solar system, we'd be up to our necks in it and we wouldn't think it's a rare resource. But there is virtually no element, uh, if you look at the tables, that um, is in abundances in carbonaceous chondrites in the most primitive type of asteroid that is um, up to the level of an ore deposit on the Earth. The only exception might be iridium, and that's barely, barely makes it. Uh, everything in space is expensive, uh, and um, bringing things from space back to Earth probably is, is not a non-starter, uh, or is a non-starter, but um, you know, it, once we're in space, that uh, changes the story quite a bit. And I'll pass it on to Antonio now. Thank you. Um, my name is Antonio Bobet. I'm a civil engineer. Um, and, um, you know, the question is maybe what I'm doing on a panel about, uh, you know, um, extraterrestrial bodies. But the question is very simple. Uh, what we do once we get there, right? Uh, so that's where civil engineering comes into place. Uh, so I was interested in this topic. My, my area's expertise are rock mechanics and uh, tunneling, um, particularly stability of underground structures, um, seismic stability. And I was involved in this topic about um, maybe not even three years ago when Professor Melosh uh, called me and said, well, we have these, uh, we think that we have these large uh, underground structures, these large tubes uh, under the moon, and uh, we don't know if they are stable or not. Um, and uh, my first reaction, because of the large uh, size, that says, you know, no, that, that's not uh, possible because a thousand meters or hundreds of meters, that's something that is uncalled for. But then we started looking at those and uh, things uh, begin to make sense because then you have to learn about, uh, you know, the different environments. Uh, we civil engineers have learned a lot about how to design and build and how to uh, be safe uh, here on Earth based on the hazards that we know of and we have experiment here on Earth but certainly as you uh, get exposed to the hazards that may be possible, that, that certainly are possible 
out there, you begin to question a lot of things that maybe you have taken for granted, right? Um, so then uh, I was involved with that. We had uh, some funding from the uh, uh, Purdue, from the provost office. Um, we uh, made, uh, I think, some progress. We had a lot of fun uh, thinking about that. Uh, recently, on uh, one of the copies with um, other faculty on what we call the Resilient Extraterrestrial Institute um, uh, here at Purdue, where we are going to put forward concepts of civil engineering, in particular the concept of resilience. This is something that we've learned over decades of uh, designing and observing how our infrastructure and our constructions behave under unexpected events. And guess what? I think we are going to have a lot of uh, those uh, when we go out uh, on the moon, on Mars, and, uh, and maybe other, other bodies, right? Um, so, uh, again, you know, the fundamental question is um, how we are going to be living, because eventually it's going to happen. How are we going to be living on the moon, Mars, and, and other places, and how we're going to take advantage of the resources that uh, we, we are going to be finding there, um, for example, for construction. Uh, how our habitats are going to be looking uh, like there. Uh, how are we going to thrive um, as, uh, as explorers out there when we are going to be exposed to all these hazards that we need to learn and we need to be able to live with. Great, so I'm Dr. Bryony Horgan, a uh, planetary geologist, and of course, if you want to go find a resource on Earth, you're an engineer running a company, what's the first thing you would do? You would hire a geologist, right? You'd hire a geologist to go out in the field and figure out what metals or whatever resource you're looking for is there, where they are, what the properties of the rocks are, how deep are they, right? And so we're doing the same thing on uh, the moon, Mars, asteroids, using uh, mostly satellites as well as landed robots, you know, rovers and things, to try to understand what kinds of minerals and water deposits are present on these bodies. And it's actually, it's a pretty hard problem because it's very different from doing mining geology on the earth. The processes are totally different. Uh, for water, for example, right? So where do you go look for water? What's the most obvious form you can imagine water being in, say, on somewhere cold like the moon? Any ideas? Ice, right? So ice is a great one. We think there's ice on the moon, but we're not really sure where it is or how much is there still, right? Even we've sent missions to do this, but it's still a big question. But we can also go looking for water in other weirder places, right? We can go looking for uh, water trapped in volcanic deposits, maybe just as, as oxygen, not even water. We can go looking for water trapped in minerals that have been formed by water. That's a great resource on asteroids that have some of these primitive materials Jay was talking about, you know, primitive water altered materials in the early solar system. On Mars, those kinds of minerals are just laying all over the surface, huge football fields of water bearing minerals on the surface. And so that's one of the things we're doing. We can look for other things too, right? What kind, you know, if you want to go to an asteroid and mine it, you have to figure out what kind of asteroid it is first. Is it the kind you want to go mine that's interesting or is it just a boring rock, right? And so to do that, we use uh, spectroscopy from satellites and telescopes to try to figure all that out. So that's what I do here is trying to understand the mineralogy of places like the moon and Mars from satellites and rovers, and that's how it plays in. All right, thank you all for those introductions and talking a little bit about what kinds of resources we have out in space waiting for us. Um, Professor Malosh, you mentioned that a lot of these, at least the metallic and elemental resources, are, are just sort of lightly sprinkled around. Could you expand on that a little bit? I know one of the, the exciting things is asteroid mining, and people think of platinum and gold, um, but you seem to be implying that maybe that's not a very feasible uh, adventure. Well, um, platinum and gold and, and iridium maybe are one of the few elements that um, whose abundance in un, so-called undifferentiated bodies uh, is comparable to that of terrestrial ores. Uh, you know, things like iron, certainly they're present, but the abundance is much less than a terrestrial ore, and no, no geologist would, would pay to open a mine in some average random rock, but that's what you have to deal with out in space. Uh, the, the most Primitive materials are so-called carbonaceous chondrites, um, which are bodies that condensed early in the solar system and whose elements did not get separated in the process of forming a uh, planet. In, in the case of our own planet, um, the, the constituents that fell onto the surface of our planet were heated, 
in impacts. Um, the, uh, the denser elements like iron sank to the core, that's, that's where they are in the center of our Earth, and the lighter elements floated to the surface and made what we have in the case of Earth a differentiated planet. Uh, that separated all the initial elements that in carbonaceous chondrites were completely mixed up. Uh, what happened further on Earth, though, to make ores was hydrothermal circulations, mainly near volcanoes and, um, and volcanic centers of different kinds that drove circulations of water in the ground that differentially picked up um, elements out of the, the average crust and concentrated them. As far as we know, there are no ores of that kind on the moon. There's very little water to form a hydrothermal circulation. We don't know about Mars yet. But um, you know, we, we don't know of any ore bodies out there to go and mine. So right now our thinking has to focus on the undifferentiated bodies uh, in which there are a few elements that are rare in Earth's crust. Iridium, for example, is one part in a trillion in Earth's crust. Well, that's not an ore. Our ores are one part in a billion. But that happens to be about their abundance in a carbonaceous chondrite. Yet still, uh, you know, how, how do we economically extract something that's one part in a billion? We, we, we'd be better off doing it on Earth, where if you go to any mine site, um, lavish use is made of water at every mine site on Earth. We have to deal with the fact that there's not a lot of water available to us in the inner solar system that we have to work with, and so it requires new technology and some new thinking about what resources uh, are, are worthwhile and how to use them. All right. Thank you. Anybody else have anything to add to that? Um, <clears throat> so um, the concept of resources, I would like to take it a little bit further. Um, so it's not only uh, things that we can take there to bring back to Earth, which eventually we'll need, right? The resources on Earth are finite and we are using them. So. Um, I'm convinced that humanity is going to survive if we are able to just uh, live on other planets. There is no question of that. Uh, but I would like to expand the concept of resource. So resource for me would be uh, a space where um, humanity, astronauts, could live, right? Um, so it's a little bit of an intangible uh, sense of resource. So, um, uh, so what are the resources in that terms that that we can uh, find and, uh, and uh, we can explore um, on the moon and Mars uh, such that all these activities, right, that we need to get these resources, right, and uh, do other things and, and build infrastructure and, and build rockets that are going to allow us to go. To so these are resources, okay? So we need to look at those also, not only uh, metals or on water, but um, uh, you know, it's, are we looking at resources on the surface where we are going to be building? Are resources underground, like the lunar lava tubes that we can use for shelter? Uh, right? Uh, what is the materials that are out there that we can use as resource uh, to build to protect against radiation, which is something that is not completely trivial. trivial. So, so th this idea of expanding this concept of resources. And it's not only very specific about you know, rare uh, earth that we may uh, need, uh, but other things that, that are important. Yeah, you could even ask a simple question like, okay, say you want to do some 3D, 3D uh, printing to construct stuff on the moon. Is the lunar soil, the regolith, is it actually appropriate for that? It is nasty, nasty material, right? So you need to think about what are the properties of it and how's that going to affect the mechanics of your process? Can you do it? How do you need to modify it? The only thing I'd add to Jay's comment is that, just a plug for the next rover that's going to Mars, if you really care about trying to find ores and interesting metals and things on another planet, we're actually sending a rover to land on one of the biggest impact basins on Mars, the Isidus Basin, Mars 2020. is gonna land and look at some of these really ancient, really messed up uh, impact deposits with big hydrothermal veins running through them and all kinds of stuff. So if you ask me in five years, <laughs> maybe I can tell you whether or not there uh, are gold and platinum and stuff on Mars for us to mine. Let, let me add, I've, I've been pretty negative about some of these resources, but I, I've, been, I've been thinking, when, when you, you say resources, I, I, like many other people, think about, um, you know, gold and you know, stuff you might mine out of the ground. There are some really abundant resources in space that we don't have on the Earth, and one of them is uh, abundant solar energy. Uh, so energy is certainly um, something that is easily harvested in open space, 
uh, not on the surface of the moon because it gets dark for two weeks and uh, storing energy will be a problem there. But um, we do certainly have a lot of, um, of power available. Uh, we also have what, what in the, many industries consider a resource is vacuum. There's a lot of that out there. And uh, you know, it's easily ad, uh, abundant or easily available. So there are some positives as well. Yeah, I, I think I would really agree that <clears throat> we, if, if you take a, you know asteroid or a mining conception to resources, it really limits you. And really, that doesn't make sense in a lot of different ways. Whereas, um, you know, we talk about solar energy, well, we harvest this with almost every spacecraft now. Uh, is completely powered by solar energy, uh, you know, the, the, the radiation and the like. Um, so even now, we're, we're utilizing these resources at a very fundamental level. And it, it is important what everyone else was saying about changing the concept. What is a resource? A resource is something that you can use. And you can't sort of be, you can't track yourself into a traditionalist model necessarily about, you know, metals or, or what have you. Lava tubes could be a fantastic resource for, for future colonies on the moon. Yeah, safety is a resource in space, right? <laughs> Those are all some, some very good points. Um, so I think, I think that sort of leads us into some of the challenges we could discuss. Um, with more conventional resources, what are the challenges with perhaps getting to an asteroid uh, and, and getting resources out, whether that be iron or regolith or water, ice, um, or, or on the moon and Mars? Uh, what are some of the challenges with, with accessing and, and using those? I think you, Professor Shears, maybe talk a little bit about accessing at least the asteroids. It's your area of expertise. R right, and, and probably the most, in, if, if you want to have this concept of resource, maybe a useful way of thinking of it is once you get to where you're going, and we have a variety of ways of doing that, is there anything there that you can utilize to, at the most fundamental level, get back, right? Uh, this is what the, the you know, people that were off uh, going from Europe to the New World, this was the, the crucial thing. They didn't build enough to go to the New World and back again. They built enough to get there. Once they got there, they figured, well, we can use the natural resources to build what we have. Right now, with the space science missions, the sample return missions that we have, and this is a big issue with Mars sample return, we have to construct something that uh, takes us to the site and brings us back. If there's anything that we can utilize that, that lessens the load, I think that's crucial. This is where something like, if, if there is an abundant source of water, you can turn this into propellant. Uh, the observation about solar energy is, is very cogent because we use this on the way there and on the way back. Um, so th those are just some thoughts. Yeah. Uh, Professor Bobet, you've mentioned the, the stability of the lunar, lunar lava tubes. Right. And so how feasible is, is setting up a habitat or some sort of operation inside one of those? Right. So um, kind of continuing maybe with the, with the idea and looking at how we can scale up things, right? Because, you know, right now um, what we may be able to do or we think we are able to do is just go there and it's a fantastic, uh, very difficult task and maybe get a sample, get back, um, you know, but, but looking ahead, right? Um, 20 years, 50 years, uh, whatever our vision is is um, uh, how we really are going to go to the moon or to an asteroid and really um, get use of the resources, again, with a generic. So the first thing that we need to know is, is uh, what's the environment, right? Uh, what's the environment where humans and equipment and machines and infrastructure, how is this environment going to affect um, how this functions? And uh, that's what I've been um, uh, looking at with, with Jay and others, is the first question is what are the hazards that are there because we are going to send people, we're going to send equipment, and we expect that for a certain time, not, not a matter of days, but maybe weeks, um, um, we are going to, or years, we are going to, um, uh, we want to do some operations, and we want to have a, a mission that is going to be successful. So the first question is, what, are the, uh, what is the environment? What are the hazards that all this is going to be exposed? And that's what we need to learn. 
and I've been learning, and the more that I learn is the more I realize that, um, that the more I, I don't know. Um, uh, so first is look at these hazards, what is the intensity, and not only looking at those, some of those are completely new to us. We don't design um, uh, launching pads or, or, or habitats. Uh, even if we look at underground um, that said, well, you know, um, how is this going to react to moonquakes, right? Um, um, and, and, and we look at, the, at, at moonquakes and, and we realize that, gosh, they are so different than the earthquakes that he, we have here on Earth. Here on Earth, that we are familiar with, right? We design for, we have codes, we have building codes, but these earthquakes, you know, they may have a significant um, intensity, but the duration is about a few tens of seconds. Um, the frequency content is, I don't know, maybe one to 10 hertz. And so then we said, well, let's look at the moonquakes. And sure enough, the intensity is much smaller as expected, uh, but then they last an hour. Gosh, um, we've never seen something like this. Um, the frequency content, we were not able to measure because the, the equipment uh, cannot register you know, high frequency content, but we expect that the frequency is going to be the order of 40, 50, or more hertz. Um, gosh, we don't have any experience with that. Um, uh, the physics may be the same, right? And, and I think that we are going to be able to work on those and, 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 and learn and try to understand. But what I'm trying to say is that, that this, is, this is completely new. We, we, are, we are faced with completely new challenges. And questions are simple as say, well, you know, we design our buildings that maybe has a probability of failure of 10 to the minus three, 10 to the minus five here on Earth, right? Um, are the same concepts going to be applicable when we design on the moon? Um, because if there's a problem here on Earth, you know, we have the resources to go there in a matter of hours. So we're going to be there trying to help and fix things. But maybe the moon is closer, but what about Mars? They're going to be months, if not maybe a year or more away. Um, so these are the challenges. The challenges are that we need to look at these things and we need to realize and we need to learn and maybe change the way we think. And these are, in my mind, you know, some of the critical challenges that, that we are a little bit far away that we really need to work on those until we feel that, yes, I think that, that we can be ready. I think that there is a lot of work to be done. There. Professor Horgan, um, I'm not sure if this is a 2020 instrument or one that's already la launched, but I understand one of the rovers has seismic monitoring. Um, so can you comment at all about Martian quakes? Yeah, so I mean, Jay probably knows more than I do, but this is the, the InSight lander, uh, which landed last year on Mars. Uh, so it's been looking for, it landed sort of in the most boring place you could possibly land on Mars, flattest place they could find. And its goal has been to try to measure uh, Mars quakes, right? To actually, to actually land and do a good job measuring uh, the first earthquakes on another planet beyond the moon. Uh, and they've they found them. They found a couple now. They're all, you know, really small, uh, kind of what they expected, more or less. And so what they're going to be able to do, hopefully, is use the collection of Mars quakes that they detect over the next year or so. Uh, to put together a model for the interior of Mars. How big is the core? You know, how often are impacts hitting it to create these quakes? What other things are creating these Mars quakes? Uh, so that's an important one. We're sending some other cool instruments too to Mars that are helping with uh, exploration. The next rover is going to have uh, an actual in situ resource utilization instrument, MOXIE, which is going to uh, attempt to extract oxygen from the CO2 in the Martian atmosphere. Uh, it should be hopefully <laughs> one and done, get there, try it out for a few months, and then you can show you can do it. But then we have you know, a very small portable instrument that can extract oxygen from the Martian atmosphere. And the last really important one is on the current rover, Curiosity. We actually have an instrument that is measuring radiation. And it measured radiation all the way from uh, launch on Earth all the way to landing on Mars in our last oh, you know, six years, seven years on Mars now. And so we know really well what the radiation risk is both in space and also on the ground on Mars. And it turns out it's actually a lot worse than we thought. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Malos, did, did you want to comment on that as well? On the Mars building for earthquakes or any of those resources? Well, th those hazards are there. And uh, radiation is 
One of the main ones that we really don't know uh, how to deal with very well. Uh, NASA's put a lot of time and effort into it and not really come up with any answers. Um, it was uh, just a couple of years ago when the then administrator of NASA came and openly admitted that radiation is a problem that they didn't know how to deal with. Before that, NASA had kind of covered over that, that aspect. At least it's in the open now and we're talking about it. Uh, it may be that the only way to get there is to depend upon people here in AEE to give us propulsion systems that'll get people to Mars really quick so we can cover up once we get there. Uh, because the amount of shielding required for, well, there are different kinds of radiation in space. There are solar cosmic rays, which um, are a problem, but you can shield against them. There are a couple of million electron volts. Galactic cosmic rays are much more energetic than that, and the amount of shielding needed is measured in meters, not in a few centimeters. And uh, really, uh, there's not much you can do except cover up in a lava tube or deep underground um, in order to get away from them. So it is something that we have to deal with. Um, and um, we're, we're making some progress to that, but um, that's uh, uh, one of the future challenges. Indeed. I think we're at about halfway. So we're gonna keep this discussion going, but we're gonna include the audience. So there are a couple of microphones um, around the room. So if you have a question for the panel or as a whole or a panelist individually, uh, go ahead and raise your hand and you'll get a mic. And don't start asking your question before you get the mic because the people that are watching online can only hear you through the mic. Hello. Okay. Um, thank you for the wonderful conversation so far. I've learned a lot. Um, I had a question for um, you, I forget your name, I'm sorry. Um, but you mentioned the, um, you, that we had several ways of getting to these asteroids and these small bodies in the, in the um, sort of inner space, I guess. Um, could you elaborate on that, please? Sure, the different technology that we, that we take to go visit asteroids. Um, <clears throat> there are a few different techniques that we use. Uh, uh, and in fact, the most, the, the most ancient of all techniques is to wait for them to come to you. And this has been happening uh, for since whenever with uh, meteorites, uh, meteors that we pick up off of the ground. Uh, so these are asteroids that have come to us and actually give us a lot of detail about what is actually out in the solar system. Now, the atmosphere serves as a screen and keeps out some of the more interesting and actually some of the more primitive asteroids preferentially and lets other ones in like, you know, the, the, the heavy uh, metal ones uh, and, and the like. So really that's one way of exploring asteroids. Um, uh, in terms of uh, space travel, we can uh, fly by an asteroid that tends to be actually rather simple to do. Um, and, but it's sort of like if I want to visit Chicago or Indianapolis or West Lafayette, I just drive down the freeway and I take a bunch of pictures as I go through and I say, okay, I visited West Lafayette. Um, I have all these great pictures. I obviously haven't really experienced the city, right? Um, same way when we have a flyby of an asteroid, we take a bunch of pictures as we fly by, but we don't stop, we don't get dinner, you know, we don't hang out, uh, try the local brews and all that. Um, so then the next level is a rendezvous mission, and that's more complex because we not only have to be on a trajectory that flies by the city, we also have to have propulsion technology to stop once we get there and drive around the streets and, you know, observe things and the like, uh, usually still from the safety and comfort of our car. So even that, you can't even get a good meal that way unless you go to the McDonald's or something, right? Um, or a drive through uh, uh, so then the next level is you actually stop, get out of the car, and wander around. Um, and this is really where we're at with asteroid exploration with the, uh, right now, the Hayabusa 2 mission, the Japanese mission. It actually has launched several rovers on the surface of their asteroid. They're hopping around, taking lots of interesting images, measurements, and the like. And even the NASA one, the Cyrus-Rex, is going to come all the way down and touch the surface grab a bunch of material, and, and eventually bring it back home. 
so yeah, th these are sort of the, the, the different levels of exploration that we can do. Everything from just sitting at home waiting for the meteorite to hit, all the way to uh, going out there, stopping, and essentially getting out of the car, touching the surface, and interacting with it. Uh, hi. Um, I think what a lot of people think of when they think of asteroid mining is they think of more the metallic achondrite uh, asteroids out there. Given their relatively low abundance, would it be even practical or reasonable to try and mine those bodies? Well, I'd say it depends on what you're after. Um, if you're after something that's not abundant in a nachondrite, that you know, would make no sense at all. Um, <clears throat> one point I might get across that you know, not everybody realizes, uh, one thing that, that is not um, underabundant out there is oxygen. Most rocks are about 90% oxygen by volume. I mean, oxygen is a big, big ion, about 40% by mass. So it's bound, and there's a lot of energy needed to unbind it. But if energy is cheap, uh, oxygen is uh, an abundant item out there. Hyd hydrogen to burn with it is something else again. You, you really need water for that. But uh, oxygen itself, at least to breathe for us humans, is, is not uh, underabundant. Um, but something Dan made uh, a mention you made about uh, meteorites also made me think iron meteorites uh, are in fact uh, something that comes from the sky and at least primitive people who could not smelt iron used iron and uh, space resources in the form of iron as a resource for many thousands of years before our technology. I might also add a sort of tangentially to these questions. We've talked about going to meteorites and asteroids and comets. Um, so what's the timeline on that from launching Hayabusa to, to landing something and, and then bringing samples back? How long are we talking for that? Yeah, so, so sort of the, the natural tempo in the solar system and for solar system exploration, if you're going to what we call near-Earth asteroids, which are asteroids that are roughly at 1 AU from the sun, the, the natural tempo is actually the year, right? So if you launch, uh, if you're close to the Earth's orbit, it takes you about a year to go around the solar system uh, and, and to, to, to do a rendezvous with uh, some other body. So usually for a near-Earth asteroid uh, mission, you're talking a, a, a few years, okay? Uh, Hayabusa, I've got the dates in my, my next talk, but uh, I think it took about two years to get to its body, and it'll take about less than a year to get back just because of the timing and all that. Once you start going out into the outer solar system, uh, the tempo starts to slow dramatically uh, because now the orbital time periods become much larger, uh, one and a half years at Mars, five years or more at Jupiter, et cetera, et cetera. So, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's sort of the, the quick answer. Thank you. Um, my question is for Professor Horgan, or maybe Professor Miloš. Um, so you mentioned that um, you guys use um, spectrometry to kind of like, you know, identify and study um, asteroids. So w let's say you guys landed on one and you discovered that there were maybe, I don't know, gold in there. Um, what other techniques can you use to say, now that I know that this particular one has gold, uh, are there any um, like asteroids that will have the same kind of resource, like so that it's not more like a trial and error, but more so like I know that if it has this kind of characteristics, it's going to have um, gold or something like that. Yeah, well, it's actually, I mean, that's a good question. One of the things we don't really know is what the, the spectral signatures of a lot of asteroids really mean, right? Because we're looking at just, you know, this one's more blue than this one. You know, it's kind of is that level of detail. So what we really have to do is, like you said, go to those places, either land on them or orbit them, see what they're really made of using other techniques. Uh, you can look at the chemistry, you can look at the more detailed mineralogy, you can do sample return, right? You can do all this stuff to really learn about it. 
Uh, we are hopefully going to go visit a metal asteroid. Uh, the Psyche mission is going to go visit an asteroid that's been hypothesized to be metallic in nature. We'll see if that's true, right? It'll be very exciting. And so hopefully after that, we'll know more. And then once you know that, you can go say, okay, I know all of these asteroids kind of look like this one I visited in their spectral signatures. And now I can say, okay, this is how many of those there are. All right, so it's really the spectroscopy is what you do. You can look at other wavelengths, right? Uh, we do a lot of visible wavelength spectroscopy because it's pretty easy with sunlight. Uh, but if you can get a little closer, you can do other wavelengths, like longer wavelengths, and get more information. So we'll keep working on it. Oh, hi. Um, can you discuss the technology of uh, seismometers that, you, that you're planning to take to these asteroids to get a better understanding of their uh, com composition? I didn't hear that. So you want, uh, you're interested in uh, oh, seismometers like, yeah. on asteroids on, or on? So that we're taking to these asteroids because you want to learn what they're made out of. Mm -hmm. and, um, can you discuss that a little okay. further? There, well, there have been, been a number of interesting proposals involving um, essentially X-raying asteroids with radio waves. Uh, the, the, the concept hasn't actually been used. Well, it was partly used on, um, on the Rosetta mission where um, when the Rosetta spacecraft uh, traveled behind from the point of view of Earth, traveled behind the comet, uh, they tried to detect radio waves passing through the comet and kind of construct a tomographic image. That was partly successful, not entirely. I, I was actually uh, a PI or a COI on an early version of that that got canceled. Uh, we were going to use higher power than, than they eventually tried using. But uh, that is certainly a, a theoretical idea that uh, may eventually work, is to use radio waves um, to uh, send the, the waves entirely through the asteroid and uh, essentially make a tomographic image of its interior. Um, if we could get things calibrated, um, I think that would be a good technique. I don't know if is is is... Um, Possibly um, the uh, Hayabusa mission doing that with Ryugyu? They certainly have that capability. Um, no, I, and in fact, they're, they're, they're not trying to do uh, radio tomography um, on the body. Uh, there, there have been proposals, again, not funded, to actually place uh, various seismometer-type objects on the surfaces of asteroids as well in order to detect uh, either micrometeorite impacts or to... To, to make larger blasts and then measure basically speed of sound, uh, transmission efficiency, and the like. Uh, these also haven't been funded as of yet. Um, I think the Hayabusa 2 spacecraft could certainly do this, especially the mascot, except they didn't put this specific type of instrument on them because uh, they were trying to cram a lot of other things in there. Mm -hmm. so. Do you consider burrowing into an asteroid to use it as a radiation shield a viable option for longer distance missions? Like traveling, like burrowing into it, making a cave, and then yeah. <laughs> propelling the asteroid? Yeah. <laughs> I, I think cool. Professor Bobit is the expert on that, aren't you? <laughs> um, well, one of the reasons why we were so excited about the, the lunar laboratories is because it's, it's, they provide shielding against radiation right, right away. And, uh, and we all even thought about, you know, if we have to mine an asteroid, you know, what's the best way to do that such that uh, then, yes, you know, you just um, borrow and then that would be a place for shelter. Uh, but, you know, um, things are more complicated than that. So I'm convinced that uh, to do that sort of thing, you, would, you need to some sort of a partnership between uh, maybe humans and robots. Um, at the very beginning, you need the, some sort of a non-human intervention to be protected against radiation until, you know, you build something that is going to provide the shelter. Uh, so that would be a mechanism um, to, to do that, right? How, you know, uh, you approach this problem and how you come up with something that is efficient um, um, it's not clear to me at, at this point because of all the difficulties associated with that, right? Um, but if that has to be, and now I think that is needed to have some sort of human intervention, right? We are not, we are not there yet in terms of robots. Um, at the very beginning, you need to provide shelter for the humans while the robots can be exposed, right? And that maybe is a transitional time until you build the shelter and then you, you, you get from there. 
So uh, if you look at the, man, uh, the uh, moon on, on Mars, you know, that would be an initial mechanism. You would use these existing underground structures as immediate shelter. And of course, there is the issue of how to get in, and, and before we were talking about how to get out, uh, but uh, it seems that is a viable uh, way of, of, of doing something that would provide some immediate shelter that you can, you can start from there. The, the idea is an old one. It was proposed, as far as I know, by Dandridge Cole in the 1950s to hollow out asteroids and make safe habitats. Yeah, and uh, just a, a, a little factoid. Um, so right now we're visiting the asteroid Bennu. Based on its meteorite analogs, we know what the density of the rocks should be, in a little over two grams per centimeter cubed. Yet the total density of the asteroid is actually more around one gram per centimeter cubed. Meaning that about half of the space inside of this asteroid is, is, is porous, is empty. Now we don't know what that looks like. Is it fine little porous voids uniformly distributed? Are there a couple larger voids or not? But you know, in terms of you know, digging a hole, burying yourself in there like a, like a ball pit, uh, you know, already half the space is empty, right? So th this could be viable. It'd be fun, right? <laughs> okay, thank you. So you all have mentioned the lava tubes on the moon. What's the next step in order to explore those and look at the feasibility of them? Well, there's actually a, a, a class that's going on here in the AE department this semester that um, is, uh, Dave Spencer is running uh, that is designing a uh, radar mission to uh, probe below, below the surface of the moon and look for, for lava tubes. It's something, we, we actually had a proposal two years ago now to do something like that with a, a ground penetrating radar and we didn't get funded. But uh, we're gonna go back and uh, talk to NASA about uh, doing that. If we consider using lava tubes as a resource, we really know, need to know um, more about them, exactly how big they are. It, with GRAIL, when we detected big empty lava tubes, all we detected really was a deficit of gravity. There, there's missing mass. We don't know the shape of the, the, um, the, the missing mass. We don't know whether it's one big volume or a bunch of small volumes. Uh, all we know is that there's missing mass. Now, some colleagues in Japan used a Kagoya ground penetrating radar. Um, in some of our, our candidate sites, and they confirmed that there were empty holes in the ground, but Kagoya was not designed to measure things underneath the surface, and uh, really, other than the confirmation that there were cavities, we don't know too much about them. Uh, so the obvious next thing to do is go, go back to the moon with a global survey, which means an orbiter, uh, with a ground-penetrating radar flying at low altitude, which thanks to grail gravity, we can now do safely, and, um, and probe beneath the surface of the moon and define the um, shape, size, and extent of those cavities that we detected with the gravity deficits. The other thing you could do is stick a robot in it, right? <laughs> it's always the solution, just throw a robot in there and see what happens. And there is actually a very cool concept out of JPL for, oh, I'm forgetting the name of the rover, Axel, I think is the rover, where it's, you know, you land, have a little lander that's basically like a, a tether platform, and then the rover is like a, two wheels attached to with a central axle that can roll away on the tether and then roll down into a lava tube, right? We know there are lava tubes on the moon, not just from Grail, but also because we see uh, skylights, you know, holes where the ceiling has fallen down. We see the black pit, we see the rubble at the bottom, we think we can see it extending away. Some of them are in places near where uh, Jay's team has seen these big lava tubes. So, you know, you could do that today, and people are proposing to do this, to go out and take this tether robot and run it down the side of the skylight and see what the tube ceiling is made out of and then go on the bottom and kind of check out the inside. It's still, it's hard, right, because sending a rover under, or any kind of robot underground is a challenge for communication and power and everything. Um, but it's something we have the technology to do. We just need the money and the will to do it. Um, and, of course, you know, the question is not only are there, how big they are, how deep they are, is also have an assessment uh, of their stability, right? So are they stable now, right? Because if we're going to put something inside, or, you know, if there is a nearby meteorite impact, or 
that is going to, not that they're going to impact the lava tube, that is going to be very unlikely, but it's going to create a seismic wave that may create problems with the stability of the, of the. So we need to know not only the geometry and the existence, but we also need to have engineering properties of that, such that we can have an evaluation of the stability. And, 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 for, and, further, for, and for that, we need geologists. There's some further interesting engineering problems with that, because if we discover uh, lava tubes underneath the surface of the moon, we're going to want to pressurize them so that we can move inside freely. Um, now, they may have been stable for you know, three billion years uh, being empty with no pressure inside. What happens when we pressurize them? Do we blow the, the, the top off? Um, exactly what, what conditions, what's going to happen? What kind of small earthquakes or moonquakes are we going to create by changing the pressures? Um, so there, there are a lot of uh, interesting engineering questions to, to answer if we get there and start working. Would it be, is this on? Oh, thank you guys for coming, by the way. Um, would it be feasible to create something similar to the Silk Road? where a network of resources is moving between different planetary objects so that they're used in places where they're needed? I mean, almost anything is possible, right? <laughs> <laughs> but is, is it, uh, yeah, the scale, or does it even make sense um, uh, in terms of transit time, transportation, and, and, and the like? Um, really, at this stage, we're more focused on exploration and just bringing back small valuable bits of matter back to Earth where we can study them very extensively. Um, uh, I, I, I don't know, and in, in based on the conversations we've had today, it's not clear that there's any breakthrough material or, or uh, other sort of resource that would make sense to actually create a more planetary economy bringing stuff from Mars to Triton to, you know, what, what have you. Although I've certainly read many science fiction books that do this quite well, right? Um, yeah, but I, I, was, I, you know, I, was, I was thinking up here pondering about what, what is a resource, and a, a resource is something that we find necessary for life. And in this sense, we do a lot of resource extraction from space and space exploration because we feed our knowledge, we feed our understanding. And this turns out to be very important for us as humans, to actually understand our place, you know, how everything came together and the like. So, and so in that sense, we could say that we're actually doing a lot of resource extraction, um, but it's not, you know, it, this is not the sort you can, you can monopolize or make money on. Well, you could, you could say that low Earth orbit is exactly that, a clear view of the entire Earth. That's a resource. I think that's getting at a really important point, though, is that you know, we're talking about, we keep mentioning you know, these rare metals and things and how they don't really make sense right now to mine, but they might eventually, right? Say you wanted to build uh, any kind of manufacturing process in space that was manufacturing electronics, for example, right? There might become a point where it is cheaper to do that rather than you know keep working on extracting more material here on Earth. It's probably a long way off, but you can imagine that eventually being the case, right? So that's when that kind of technology will be helpful. But, but coming back to your Silk Road, we we at uh, a couple of years ago we had a, a uh, faculty member Dan Dumbacher who was here. He liked to talk. I mean, he unfortunately well he left to become the executive president of the AIAA. So he's, he's certainly in contact with us and helping us. But um, he talked uh, a lot about what he called the Space Audubon, the, the idea that rather than making a one-off going out to some, some location as part of a mission, but you know, you know, imagining a highway where we go both directions and you know, connect to things out there. Uh, we at one time advertised our, our RETH program as providing the um, gas stations and motels for that space Audubon. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming. Um, the main question I was asked, or I'm wondering, is that you mentioned that we're currently trying to practice these sample return and rendezvous missions with uh, near Earth objects. Do you think as we become more comfortable with this, we'll continue making risks to more farther out bodies, such as Kuiper Belt objects or even like Hovian moons? Thank you. 
Um, yeah, yeah I, I think the <clears throat> motivation to do this is extremely strong um, uh, to go further and further out. The, with, the, with our current technologies, however, there's a, a large price to pay, which is time. Uh, uh, with our capabilities now to go further out, to, to do a sample return from a Kuiper Belt object would be an extremely long endeavor with our current technology. Even if we had you know, very effective propulsion systems, you're still talking you know, 20 years. Uh, 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 and, and if you think just about the, you know, what's the timeline for Mars sample return now, which is arguably you know, next to the moon and maybe some near-Earth asteroids, the easiest body to go to to get material. And, and it's what, like six years or something minimum for the toll process. Right, and, and when is launch? Uh, uh, maybe 2026, <laughs> you can ask me in 2026. So I have a question here. So the, we've, I don't know how long we've um, looked at these lava tubes over a period of time, but do we know how like various geological effects have impacted them, such as asteroid impacts or uh, moon quakes, and if these lava tubes, new ones have been created or old ones have been closed off to us in like the last like how many every years? Uh, well, we have a moderately good idea of the flux of near-Earth asteroids, and um, there's none targeted on us right now that we know of. Um, but on the other hand, there's small things that come into our atmosphere um, all the time. Uh, Professor Shears and I just served on an NRC panel uh, trying to figure out the best way for NASA to find these objects and came to the conclusion that a, um, a moderate aperture infrared telescope at L1 would do the job of finding most 140 meter plus um, objects over the next 10 to 20 years. Uh, there are still many smaller objects that fall into our atmosphere. The threat from an asteroid impact depends an awful lot on how big the asteroid is. And asteroids come in all sizes, but in general there are a lot more small ones than big ones. Uh, that, that, uh, many people have worked to, to define that hazard, uh, and occasionally we get reminded by a, either a close flyby or something like Chelyabinsk that, uh, you know, we live in a shooting gallery, and uh, every now and again we get hit, and that's just life on Earth. Uh, Nick, this will probably be our last question. Thank you. Um, so for Professor Shears, uh, what challenge have you, uh, challenges have you specifically faced in your research and um, what is the near future of asteroid uh, exploration? Okay, so th that's a perfect advertisement for my talk. So, <laughs> because there are real challenges, uh, but they're all solvable, okay? The, the, the interesting thing about being a, an engineer is you can usually figure out a solution. Now, it may not be the best solution, it may, you know, it may cost a lot or it may require you know, extra energy and effort, but there are ways of always uh, solving the problem at hand. And then over time, we like to refine these and become, you know, sort of optimize the process so we can solve the problems that we're trying to solve, do the things we want to do more and more efficiently. Uh, in terms of the future of asteroid exploration, there are many missions right now. I, I can name four for sure, or three for sure, maybe four for sure, that are being planned by just by NASA that will actually explore various questions related to these um, uh, uh, to, to asteroids and, and primitive bodies. So there's certainly a, a large future. Um, I, I think there is some push to do more sample return, but I also think that as we take more samples and bring them back to Earth, we'll probably get a better and better context for the meteorites that we have and be able to interpret them more and more accurately and interpret remote spectra more accurately. So we may actually have a lower requirement for samples from, say, all asteroids. Although samples from comets, that's a different thing. That would be exciting. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for attending. Oh, one more question. I'm sorry, we thought we had <laughs> the last one. One more. Professor Milosh, you've made an extraordinary statement. 
that the radi space radiation problem is a lot worse than we thought, that we would need shielding of the order of a few meters. Uh, could you comment further on that, and what would be the result or consequence of going to Mars without that shielding? Well, I'm referring to galactic cosmic rays, which are more energetic and therefore more t penetrating. And the thing about galactic cosmic rays, they have so much energy, they're mostly protons, but uh, they have so much energy that the high energy proton hitting your shielding explodes the nucleus it strikes and makes even more radiation that makes a shower of uh, ionizing radiation that penetrates into the, the surface that it struck. Um, in the case of the galactic cosmic rays, you know, a little bit of shielding is worse than none at all. Uh, you know, 10 centimeters of aluminum are worse than nothing. Uh, you need to talk, we need to talk about meters in order to fully shield against that. That's something that what, one of the attractions of lava tubes or, uh, either on Earth or on Mars, um, we know that there are lava tubes on Mars as well, and they're also large, um, is that they, they have tens of meters of rock um, between the cavity and the surface. Um, if they didn't have that, they wouldn't be stable. And um, as a result, they could easily shield against the cosmic rays. And, and there are other advantages. There are also huge temperature swings that, that are shielded against uh, underground and um, various other advantages that we have going here. But, but galactic cosmic rays are a really tough problem. Um, any structure that you put on the surface, right, will need a pile-up of stuff, could be regolith, that is going to be meters thick, just to protect against radiation. So, so just cannot build something and then hope what, that it's going to be protected. You need to pile up, and that's like a little bit the idea that is out there, the regolith, few meters on top of that, uh, which, on the other hand, would have the advantage of helping the structure, because the structures uh, at least the structure on the Moon uh, and Mars um, are going to be working with pressure inside um, because we need an atmosphere. Uh, and that means that uh, most of the materials that we build with, they work very well in compression but not in tension. And you have something pressurized, then you are, you are working with tension and you put in the shield on top. That's going to be helping. But that means that the infrastructure and the work that you need to do to build this is significant. Make sure it's safe for me to stand up now. <laughs> Sorry, I had my cues mixed a little bit. Can you join me in thanking our panel today? So Professor Brioni Horgan, <laughs> Professor Antonio Bovet, Professor Jay Malosh, Professor Dan Shears, and Mr. Andrew Cox. <laughs>